be prepared for a lot of awkwardness. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 most confrontational talk show moments. For this list, we'll be looking at the most confrontational talk show moments. To qualify, the moment must be genuine in some way, so staged confrontations like Jerry Lawler's fight with Andy Kaufman on David Letterman will not be considered. We're going to applause here for station identification. Get the hose out here. And while R. Kelly's interview with Gail King on CBS This Morning is infamous, it will not be included either as the focus is solely on talk shows. What? How stupid would I be to do that? I didn't say you That's were holding- That's stupid, guys! I didn't Is this camera on me? Yes, it's on. That's stupid! Use your common sense. Don't forget the blogs. Forget how you feel about me. Hate me if you want to, love me if you want, but just use your common sense. How stupid would it be for me to, with my crazy past and what I've been through? Number 10, Dakota's Birthday, The Ellen DeGeneres Show. Ellen DeGeneres is rarely caught off guard by any of her guests, which makes this particularly awkward exchange with Dakota Johnson all that more captivating. It's good to see you. Happy it's belated you birthday. Too. When was your birthday? It was October 4th. October 4th. <laughs> you turned 30. I did. And um, how was the party? I wasn't invited. After inquiring about the actress's birthday party, Ellen made the mistake of mentioning that she was not invited. A throwaway joke that ended up not being true, a fact Johnson wasted absolutely no time in correcting. Actually, no, that's not the truth, Ellen. You were invited. Last year, no, last time I was on the show, last year, you gave me a bunch of about not inviting you, but I didn't even know you wanted to be invited. Well, who doesn't want to be invited to a party? Well, I didn't even know you liked me. <laughs> Ellen's comedic timing does manage to diffuse some of the tension out of the situation, although that does not make the interview's opening few minutes any less uncomfortable to watch. Ask everybody. <laughs> Ask Jonathan, your producer. Who okay. said you were? I yeah, was invited? Right Why didn't I go? I don't know. Was it, was it, it, oh yeah, I had that thing. Um. <laughs> Number nine, Norman Mailer versus Gore Vidal, The Dick Cavett Show. I'd really like to get into a discussion with Gore. He's been saying absolutely uh, uh, unspeakable things about me. He's been acting even worse than he usually does as a polemicist. Uh, and, uh, hmm. you know, you know he's, he's really, uh, he, he's shameless in intellectual argument. He's absolutely without character, a moral foundation, or even intellectual substance. The Dick Cavett Show had its share of explosive sessions over the years, but few compare to the sheer ferocity that defined Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal's segment. Norman did a book on women's liberation mm -hmm. and his attitudes towards sex, some very interesting, some quite outrageous. He was very anti-women's liberation piece, and he was very mean to a couple of the girls, particularly Kate Millett. And I answered this, his piece, and a number of others. You know, I, Norman is taking everything too personally. While everyone got their licks in, Mailer was the driving force behind this confrontational debate. With the writer mocking Vidal's career, personality, and pretty much everything besides his political campaign. I guarantee you I wouldn't hit any of the people here because they are smaller. In what ways? <laughs> intellectually. Well. Intellectually smaller. Well, let's, let me turn my chair and join these three. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you'd like two more chairs to contain your giant intellect. Mailer even challenged Cabot and the audience's intelligence, while aboard Janet Flanner sat there like a frustrated teacher presiding over a couple of school children. While things never quite got violent on screen, Mailer reportedly headbutted Vidal earlier that night. Hey, can I talk to the audience for Why a moment? don't you fold it five ways and put it where the moon don't shine? <laughs> Number eight, Vince McMahon versus Bob Costas. On the record with Bob Costas. Vince McMahon, thanks for coming, Vince. Pleasure. XFL ratings are down 75% from week one. 
they now rival the lowest ratings ever in prime time, not just for a sports program, but for any television show. Right. Can you guarantee me right now that there will be a year two for the XFL? While some discussions start gently and gradually grow more confrontational, Bob Costa's interview with WWE's Vince McMahon is underpinned by a palpable fierceness right from the start. But in most people's minds, not with prestige because of the type of programming you're associated with. On the other hand, NBC has prestige. Right. They risk not just dollars, they risked prestige. Coming across more like an interrogation than a discussion, Costas grilled his guest on the failings of the XFL, a then new football league created by McMahon that would ultimately go bust within a year of debuting, while also not painting professional wrestling in the most positive light. You, you want to let me finish here for a second, pal? I'm asking okay. you the question. Then, then coach, shut your mouth and let me answer the question, all right? I'll be happy to answer. Let me finish. By the time the interview came to an end, McMahon appeared on the verge of body slamming the host, although the pair would meet up for a much more cordial episode a year later. Number 7. Morton Downey Jr. vs. Seika – The Morton Downey Jr. Show In hindsight, The Morton Downey Jr. Show was closer to programs like The Jerry Springer Show than modern-day talk shows. Ten bookstores. Yes. At 23 years old, folks, isn't this a wonderful country? 23 years old, you had 10. Where'd you get your money from? I started out with one store, very small. Mob didn't give you the money? Mob? Mob. No. The pilot episode dealing with the adult film industry instantly established the tone for the show, as the host utilized an aggressive interviewing style designed to put actress Seika immediately on the defensive. How about do you agree with the fact that uh, do you agree with the fact that 50% of all porn is controlled by the mob and 90% of all money made from hard porn through the distribution is handled by the mob? Do you no, believe I with do that, not porn? Agree with that? You don't believe with that. The live audience ate up Downey's savage takedown of his guest, even if the whole thing comes across as a sensationalist stunt that sought to belittle Seika for easy ratings. You because damn right it makes them right. You damn right. Government? I'd much rather hear it from those people who have studied it than from someone who's laid down with everyone that they can find in a porn film. <laughs> much rather. It's hardly surprising that Seika walked out during a commercial break. Number 6. Patti LaBelle Isn't Having It – The Tyra Banks Show who knew that a pretty short conversation revolving around cupcakes and paper could be so uncomfortable? There's this has paper on it. Yeah, you can't eat the paper. Nope. Now these are but made you can with. Touch them with your hands. That is true. Two kinds of cake mix. What seems to start out as a genuine misunderstanding between Hungry Girl cookbook writer Lisa Lillian and guest Patti LaBelle regarding the paper surrounding the cupcakes quickly turns into an improv session with cringeworthy attempts at humor and condescending remarks. All things considered, LaBelle managed to keep her cool despite being spoken to like a toddler. While the animosity dies down relatively quickly, a segment about cupcakes should never have been this tense to watch. Diet hot cocoa. What is Patty saying over there? She is causing trouble. Yeah, no, what, what makes you think I think I can eat the paper, boo? Yeah, you can eat the paper. No, no paper. Paper bad, cake good. Okay, next. The incident was so infamous that it inspired a 2020 Saturday Night Live sketch starring SNL cast member Ego Wodum as LaBelle stand-in Cookie LaFloof and host Daniel Craig as the put-upon celebrity chef. Well, don't eat the foil. <laughs> what? Uh, uh, the aluminium foil on the... Just don't, just don't eat the foil that's... I don't want to eat the foil. Okay. I'm, I'm making sure. Don't eat the foil? Who is this man? <laughs> Number 5. Tom Cruise versus Matt Lauer – Today I've never agreed with psychiatry, ever. Uh, before I was a Scientologist, I never agreed with psychiatry. And then when I started studying the history of psychiatry, I started realizing more and more why I didn't agree with psychiatry. And as far as the Brooke Shields thing is, look, you gotta understand, I really care about Brooke Shields. During an interview with today's then undisgraced host, Matt Lauer, Tom Cruise opened up about life and mental health in a rant that would arguably change the public perception of the actor forever. Matt, you have to understand this. Here we are today, where I talk out against drugs and psychiatric abuses of electric shocking people, mm -hmm. okay, against their will, of drugging children with them not knowing the effects of these drugs. Do you know what Adderall is? Do you know Ritalin? The strangest thing about this whole ordeal was that the interview was perfectly cordial for the first half, but the tone changed once Lauer mentioned Scientology, which snowballed into Cruz sharing his distrust about psychiatry as someone who knew the profession's long history. 
So you're you're advocating it. I am not. I'm telling you, in their <laughs> case, like, what's in their that? individual case, it worked. I am not going to go out Matt, and say, get your kids on Ritalin, it's the cure-all and the end-all. Matt, but here's the point. What is an ideal scene in life? The interview got particularly heated once Brooke Shields became the topic of discussion, with Cruz even going so far as to describe Lauer as a glib. Maybe there are too many kids on Ritalin. Maybe electric shock... Too many kids on Ritalin? Matt. I'm just saying, but, but aren't there Matt. examples where it Matt. works? Matt, Matt, you, you don't even... You're glib. You don't even know what Ritalin is. If you start talking about chemical imbalance, you have to evaluate and read the research papers on how they came up with these theories, Matt. Okay, that's what I've done. Number four, Whoopi Goldberg versus Bill O'Reilly, The View. As multiple arguments on The View can attest, it's only natural that discussions get heated when politics, religion, or 9-11 are involved. So many questions, I know you have. Yeah, so, okay. Look at you, Look, every time I come on here, she's, how did this happen? <laughs> Rosie O'Donnell and Elizabeth Hasselbeck had a notable exchange in 2007, but it was Bill O'Reilly's guest appearance in 2010 that saw tensions boil over to unprecedented heights. Yes. And then the guy this says, and then the guy, this well, is hold America. it, hold it, listen to me because you'll learn. Oh. All right? O'Reilly's generalization of Muslims prompts a verbal tirade from Whoopi Goldberg, who then proceeds to leave the set alongside co-host Joy Behar. Why is it in a lot of with 70 families died? Muslims what are you killed this on 9-11. No. No. Oh That's my god! Why. That is in retrospect, there was not friction immediately between O'Reilly and Goldberg, but things certainly did not take long to escalate. Number 3. Rosie O'Donnell vs. Tom Selleck, The Rosie O'Donnell Show in the aftermath of the Columbine High School massacre, Rosie O'Donnell and Tom Selleck ended up in a now infamous debate over gun control. You know, I, I understand how you feel. Um, this is a really contentious issue, probably as contentious and potentially as troubling as the abortion issue in this country. Uh, all I can tell you is rush, it rushes to pass legislation at a time of national crisis or mourning. I, I don't really think are, are proper. Selleck, who came on the talk show to promote the romantic comedy The Love Letter, was blindsided by O'Donnell, who was far more interested in discussing the NRA, guns, and the Second Amendment. I, I'm not, a, I can't speak for the but NRA. But you're their spokesperson, Tom, I so you have to be responsible for what they say. I'm not a but if you put your name out and no, say, wait, I, don't Tom put words Selleck. In my mouth. I'm not a spokesperson. Remember but you're how saying that you said? You'd be, now you're questioning my humanity. No, not your humanity. Oh. I think you're a very humane man. Okay, I'm saying well, that if you say, say... I disagree with you, but I think you're being But you can't say that I will not take That's responsibility fair. for anything the NRA represents. While Selleck tried to maintain a degree of composure and civility early on in the debate, the actors seemed to give up once it became apparent this argument was just going to go around in circles. I didn't come on your show to, to have a debate. I came on your show to plug a movie. That's that's what I'm doing here. And that's if what we did. If you think it's proper to have a debate about the NRA, I'm trying to be fair with you. As but I am th trying to. This is absurd. To. You're calling me a spokesman for the NRA. Number two, Hibraldo. Geraldo. While sometimes arguments arise from unlikely pairings, certain situations are purposefully crafted to spark controversy and hostility. If you have true belief in your convictions and your movement is as good and as powerful as you say it is. Why are you afraid to let other people speak? Why are you not like other minorities and allow other people to uh, pursue whatever happiness they find in whatever religion they find? When Geraldo invited a white Aryan resistance youth member onto the same show as civil rights activist Roy Innes, the talk show presumably anticipated a few fireworks, although a full-on brawl presumably exceeded the expectations of even the most ambitious of TV execs. The reason why I do that is because I get sick and tired of hearing the sob stories from I get sick and tired of seeing Uncle Tom here sucking up trying to be a white Go ahead, Roy, go ahead. No, let me tell you. After one particularly racist comment, Innes took matters into his own hands before the show lost complete control of its guests and audience. <laughs> By the end, Geraldo Rivera ended up with a broken nose and a rating smash. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are a few honorable mentions. Abel Ferrara interview, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, because Ferrara wanted to be anywhere but doing an interview with Conan O'Brien. We're gonna get those Stallone <laughs> subtitles in here, right? Meaning what? What does that mean? I didn't catch you, 
you're what talking does that very mean? lowly. Morton Downey versus Kelly Everts. The Morton Downey Jr. Show. Because unwanted pelvic thrusts have no place in a civilized conversation. Let me introduce you to a new guest on home base. Her name is Kelly Everett, and she's a stripper for God. Kelly, let me tell you something, pal. If there's ever a milk strike, I'll know where to go. <laughs> a rude interruption. The Wendy Williams Show. Because Wendy Williams cut loose on an audience member with a disruptive phone. Somebody phone on? Yeah. yeah. Get out. <laughs> Get out. Let's turn that phone off now. So, ma'am, whoever you are. Harvey Pekar wilds out. Late night with David Letterman. Because bad-mouthing the host's boss on live TV is bad manners. She remarks about GE, but there's a reason that, you know, people should be, you know, watching GE real close that don't have nothing to do with, you know, Robert Wright's toilet habits. And I want to tell you something about that stuff. No, wait a minute, I'm serious. No, we're Number one, let's sh damn it now, man, don't mess with me. Paris Hilton. Late show with David Letterman. Because Letterman wanted to know about Hilton's time in jail and refused to let up. New York City is exciting though, isn't it? I was born here, yeah. Yeah, good for you. Uh, how'd you like being in jail? Uh... Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Jim Everett versus Jim Rome. Talk two. Jim, good to have you on the show. Good to be here, Jim. Thank you. Check that, Chris Everett. Good to have you on the show. You know what? You know you've been calling me that for about the last five years. About uh, two years, actually, Chris. Well, hey, you know what? Let me let me say one thing. A moment so infamous, South Park parodied it more than a decade later. After years of Talk Two's Jim Rome poking fun at Jim Everett by calling him Chris instead, in reference to the female tennis player of the same name, the Los Angeles Rams quarterback dared the host to repeat it one more time during an interview. You know, we're sitting here right now, and if you guys want to take a station break, you can. But if you call me Chris Everett to my face one more time, I already did you it better, twice. You better if you call it one more time. We better st take a station break. Rome did so and instantly regretted it. The segment is so outlandish, it almost seems staged. However, Everett has always maintained that it was legitimate. Exactly. Well, we got no problem well, I with think that. It, I think that you, you probably won't say it again. I bet I do. Okay. Chris? Considering neither party came out of this scuffle looking particularly good, it does seem pretty real. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.